We're now going to move on to the sliding filament model and muscle contraction. So we're going to talk about kind of how actin and myosin are going to interact with each other and cause a muscle contraction. And we will also talk about how a motor neuron will initiate the contraction and kind of what takes place. In this image, um, what you're actually seeing is a motor neuron that is synapsing on to the, um, the motor units, the muscles. So before we get started, I want to just do a little bit of a review of actinomycin. So all of this information we talked about last time in our lecture, um, but it's good to review because we really need to know what are the players in the sliding filament model. So first we have the myosin filament, and this is going to be the thick filament. Okay, so myosin is going to have a head and it's also going to have a tail. The head is going to be kind of our main focus for the sliding filament model because the head is going to directly interact with the actin. On the head, we have these actin binding sites, and they will be what will bind to the actin. Now the mycin head is interesting because it has ATPase um, activity, enzyme activity, which means that it's able to hydrolyze ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. When that happens, there is going to be a release of energy. And so that energy is going to be really important because it's going to actually change the, sh the shape of the head kind of the orientation of the head, I should say. When the energy is released, it is going to cause the head of the myosin to go into what we call the cocked position, which is the position that is going to allow for the actual um, muscle contraction. So it's going to be bound to the actin, it will be in the cocked position, and then we will able, that cocked position will be able to kind of move the head in relation to the actin filament and kind of move the actin filament. Now the actin filament, which we call the thin filament, is going to be made out of these actin subunits that are kind of little, look like beads. Um, they're globular proteins that are going to be strung together and then two strands of actin will then be kind of coiled around each other. The then is going to be the another strand which is going to be called tropomyosin all right now when we're in a relaxed state we are going to have tropomyosin sitting on top of actin and the myosin binding sites that are on actin and so if you look at your myosin if you look at the little globular proteins they have this little dip in them which is going to be where the myosin head will actually sit now, when there's no calcium, what happens is that the tropomyosin will sit right on top of where the myosin binding site is, preventing myosin from binding there. Okay, so this is when the muscle is relaxed, um, they'll be completely covered, and so myosin will not be able to bind to the actin filament. This is important. We do not want our muscles constantly contracting. We want them to contract when necessary and when they're supposed to. Now, there's a second um, molecule that's also going to be on top of the actin, and this is going to be called troponin. So troponin is going to be kind of a regulator protein. We have, you can see the troponins right here. It's kind of in the lighter yellow. The troponin is going to be bound both to tropomycin and to the actin. Now, when calcium enters the system, the troponin will be bound or the calcium will bind to the troponin and that will cause the tropomycin to slide off of the binding sites and so at that point you then are going to have kind of an open access for the myosin to bind and that will then be kind of the beginning of our um, muscle contraction so here's just uh, an image of how this kind of works we're going to go through the sliding filament model of how this takes place um, this is obviously an active muscle. We have calcium in the system. The myosin binding sites are active um, and available. And we have tropomycin that is not on top of 
those actin um, myosin binding sites. So the sliding filament model of contraction has to do with kind of the activation of the cross bridges that were, will be able to generate force. And so they're going to be able to cause the muscle to contract. Now, shortening is going to occur when the tension created by these cross bridges on thin filament will actually exceed the force opposing the shortening, okay? And so um, there always are gonna be opposing forces, but when we have kind of more force in the contracting sense, that will then cause contraction. When contraction ends, the cross bridges will become inactive and will no longer be connected. And so the cross bridge is going to be when we actually have myosin bound to actin. So if we have our, um, our actin little strands and then we have our myosin heads, when the head is bound to the actin, we will consider this a cross bridge, okay? Because you're bridging between the two different filaments. So we're now looking at kind of the model of the sliding filament, and we're going to see what this structure looks like when we're in rest and when we're in contraction mode. Now, the first thing to notice is that when we're in relaxed state, and this is going to be the top, there is a little bit of overlap between the actin and the myosin. And so we see the kind of overlap right here and right here, but we don't have complete overlap. Okay, so there is going to be kind of in this area, we're gonna have slight overlap um, at the ends of the A band. Now, when there is contraction, what's gonna happen is that we are going to have more overlap of the actin and myosin. And so if you look at the bottom image, you can see that the overlap is actually going to be this entire area where we have myosin and actin completely overlapped with each other. Now, we're not changing the length of any of the actin or myosin, we're just changing how, kind of, how much they're overlapping each other. Okay, so if you would t take a re uh, ruler out and measure the length of the actin and myosin in the top picture versus the bottom picture, they're going to be identical to each other. Um, so it's just gonna be the overlap that's actually changing. Now, when we have the nervous system going, bringing in a nerve impulse that is going to cause uh, muscle contraction, what's gonna happen is that this is when we'll have the myosin heads that will bind to the actin um, binding sites, and they will form the cross bridge. So again, a cross bridge is going to be when actin and myosin are actually bound to each other. And then this is going to start when contraction will start to take place. Now, when the cross bridges form this attachment, they will bind and cause the actin filament to kind of overlap more and more with the myosin filament. Okay, so you will see that the thin filaments will start to kind of go towards that M line um, in the very center, which causes the entire muscle to shorten. The Z discs and the Z lines are going to be pulled toward the M line. The I band is going to shorten and the Z discs become closer and the H zone is gonna disappear. So the H zone is this area between kind of where the M line is and then the area that has kind of just the, um, just the myosin. And so the H zone is right kind of surrounding the M line. The A bands move closer to each other. So if you see you have A band here these would also be an A band. You'd have an A band here and an A band over here. We don't see the entire thing, but those would also be getting closer to each other. Okay, and so you can imagine the sarcomeres, which is gonna be this functional unit, are going to all then contract, get shorter, which is gonna cause the total length of the myofibril and then the myofiber, the muscle fiber, to contract and shorten 
and cause that. So if we look at what a fully relaxed sarcomere looks like, um, we have both the cartoon version and we also have a, an actual picture of the muscle fiber. And so this is what it would look like. You can see kind of the different zones um, on here and the overlap areas. When we compare that to then a fully contracted sarcomere, you can see that many things have changed. And one of the biggest thing is that you have shortened kind of the, the A, um, a zone. Okay, so that's going to be tighter in there. We brought the Z's, Z lines, and this closer to the M line. And so everything has contracted. So now that we know a little bit about how the sliding filament model works, we need to now take a step back and start talking about how the whole process of this contraction is going to begin. And it's going to begin with an actual neural impulse. So when there's the decision to move, and we're talking about skeletal muscles, so these are, these are conscious um, decisions, we are going to have signals from the brain that will then be transmitted down through your spinal cord and then will be transmitted from the spinal cord to the muscles through motor neurons. Motor neurons are going to be specific neurons that will activate muscle fibers. The neurons and muscle cells are going to be capable of becoming excited, which is going to be kind of this process of how we will transmit this neural impulse. Okay, so excitation is going to then cause for the contraction to happen. When we have something that is excitable, they're going to be able to have action potentials. Now, when we have excitable cells, change their membrane potential, the resting membrane potential, we can then have an action potential take place. Now, as the action potential is going to go from the motor neuron to the neuromuscular junction to the muscle cell, we are then going to have the release of a neurotransmitter, which is going to be, in this case, acetylcholine. And it's going to be um, usually abbreviated as ACH. Okay, so if you see ACH, that means acetylcholine. So this is a, a common neurotransmitter and it is going to be the neurotransmitter that is going to kind of be one of the first um, initiating steps of the muscle contraction. Now, in order for us to understand the resting membrane potential and how an action potential is going to take place, we do need to discuss ion channels and if you haven't already, I would watch that first lecture video where I talked a little bit about kind of an overview of the nervous system and resting membrane potentials and action potentials, because that will give you a, a, a little bit more of an in-depth look into that. Um, what we're going to talk about right now is just the different types of ion channels that we're going to be dealing with with um, muscle contraction. And so ion channels are going to be very important in changing the membrane potentials they are going to allow for different ions to move into and out of the cell and that in itself is going to be able to cause the action potential. Now there are two different types of ion channels that we'll be discussing. We have some that are going to be chemically gated ion channels and in our case we're going to be specifically talking about a acetylcholine gated um, channel. So this channel is going to only open when in the presence of acetylcholine. Okay, so if acetylcholine is not present, this channel will not open. Okay, so an acetylcholine is gonna be a receptor on muscle cells. There are then gonna be the second type of ion channel, which are called voltage-gated ion channels. Those are going to open when there is a voltage change inside the cell. So if the membrane potential all of a sudden changes, from negative to positive, it's then going to trigger this change in conformation of the protein that is part of the, the ion channel. Okay, and so for example, in this specific case, um, when the ion channel is stimulated, we're going to have the protein that kind of opens up and allows for, in this case, we're mainly going to be talking about sodium going in. So where we have direct connection between 
a neuron and the muscle, we are going to call this area the neuromuscular junction. Okay, and so this is going to be where they interact with each other. Okay, the skeletal muscles are stimulated by somatic motor nerves, and that just means motor is going to cause some type of movement. Okay, and we will talk a little bit about axons. They are going to be the neurons, so there are these long thread-like extensions of a motor neuron. Okay, and so in this image, we can't see the kind of the cell body of the neuron, but we just see the axon. So this is kind of the tail of the axon that's going to allow for the transmission of the action potential to the muscle fiber. Each of the axon um, tails are going to be kind of divided. And on this image, you can see three divisions of this motor neuron that they are then landing onto kind of three different uh, muscle cells. When we get closer into kind of where the neuromuscular junction is, we are going to talk about this, the part of the muscle, which we're going to call the motor end plate. And so the neuromuscular junction is going to have the terminal end of an axon, and then you're going to have a motor end plate, which is going to be where the muscle is actually going to start. Okay, and so each muscle fiber has one neuromuscular junction with one motor neuron. Okay, and this makes sense. You wouldn't want to have two different neurons coming into the same muscle because the way that these muscles are situated, that would cause kind of a strange pattern of contraction. So here is going to be the kind of terminal end of the motor neuron and then the motor end plate. Okay, so the axon terminal is going to be the end of the axon. And so this would be if we're looking at the very end of one of those axons. And it's going to then interact with the muscle cell or the muscle fiber. Okay, now what we have here are a couple different parts that we need to discuss. So um, we are going to I'll kind of outline this for you. So we have this is going to be the terminal uh, axon axon terminal that is outlined in black and then we are going to have the motor end plate which is going to be what i'm going to highlight in red okay and so this is going to be the this is part of the actual muscle okay you're going to notice that the axon terminal and the motor end plate do not actually touch physically and instead, there is a structure called the synaptic cleft, which is going to be this area between the axon terminal and the motor end plate. Okay. Inside the axon terminal, we are going to have a couple important structures. We have synaptic vesicles, which are going to kind of hold, in this case, acetylcholine. Um, those acetylcholine molecules will be extremely important in kind of triggering the, the action potential um, into the muscle cell. And we're also going to have um, some other important ion channels. And so we're going to have um, specifically these ion channels that are going to be acetylcholine um, activated. Okay, and so the little green dots are going to be acetylcholine. And then when you see the green dots attached onto um, that ion channel, that is going to be a acetylcholine activated channel. Okay. Now, in the infoldings of the sarcolemma, and remember the sarcolemma is just outside of a muscle cell, there are going to be called these junction folds. And the junction folds are part of the motor end plate. Um, they're just kind of, they increase the surface area and allow for millions of acetylcholine receptors to be in that area. Okay, so the neural muscle, muscular junction is going to consist of the axon, the synaptic cleft, and the juxtal folds of the um, motor end plate. So we're now going to start going over kind of the actual skeletal muscle contraction, and there's going to be four main steps that are going to go over this. This image right here is going to show kind of all four of the events, and we're going to go into the, each of the events um, in detail.
So the first part is going to be all of the events that take place at the neuromuscular junction. So we're not really going to talk about how a nerve impulse is sent from the brain. We're just going to be talking about how it's going to be received at the motor end plate. Okay, so um, when you start taking um, 58B and they start talking about the nervous system and how kind of different things happen, that's when you'll learn about kind of the brain's control of all of this. The second step is going to be the muscle fiber excitation. So this is going to be an action potential that's going to then be transmitted from the neuron to the muscle fiber. We then are going to have excitation contraction coupling. And so this is how an action potential, the excited muscle is going to then lead to contraction. And finally, we have cross bridge cycling. So this is going to be the actual contraction step where the myosin heads are going to bind the actin and then we're going to have contraction take place. So we're now going to talk about the events that take place at the neuromuscular junction. And so this is just going to be a, be an overview and then we'll go into more depth. So I'm going to draw for you um, our axon terminal. And we're going to start with arrival of an action potential at the axon terminal. Okay, so we have an action potential that has been sent um, and we are now kind of at the point where we are going to then have an interaction between the um, axon terminal and then also the muscle. Okay, and so I'm going to draw the motor plate where we're gonna have interaction. Um, remember that we are going to have, this is the sarcolemma, so this is the outside of the muscle cell, um, and there are going to be different types of um, ion channels that are going to be there, okay? Now, when the action potential reaches the axon terminal, it's going to activate calcium channels, and so I'm going to draw two little calcium channels right here, and what's going to happen is that calcium, which is outside of the neuron is going to actually enter into the um, axon terminal. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to cause for the synaptic vesicles that are present in the end of this axon to release their substance, okay? And they're going to have um, acetylcholine inside of them. So I can draw little molecules of acetylcholine in here. And so what's going to happen is that some of these will then fuse and open and release their acetylcholine into the actual synaptic cleft. Okay? So calcium entry causes acetylcholine neurotransmitters to um, enter into the synaptic cleft. Okay? That's then going to cause our acetylcholine ion channels to open. Okay, and so I'm going to draw some of these on our motor end. Okay, and what that's going to then cause is for sodium. Okay, so we're going to have sodium. Sodium, which is also present in this synaptic cleft, sodium is everywhere. Okay, sodium is going to enter into the muscle cell, okay? Go, it's enter into the muscle cell through these acetylcholine ion channel um, that are on the sarcolemma, okay? The acetylcholine binding to the receptors, okay? So what's going to cause them to open is that we have... It's hard for me to draw this, but we're going to have the actual acetylcholine that's going to bind to those sodium channels, and sodium is going to rush inside. Okay, so we're going to have sodium moving into the cell. Okay, when the kind of this process is kind of has, you know, it's, it's going to go in a way but it's ultimately going to need to go away. And so we're going to have these other molecules called acetylcholine esterases. And what their job is to do is break down acetylcholine. 
So if it breaks down acetylcholine, acetylcholine is no longer going to be available, and that will then stop the channels from being open. Okay, so once we're done, acetylcholine will then block. Um, when it's no longer present, it will then have the, make the channels start to close. Okay, so here we're going to, in a much better diagram, we're going to see how this works. And so we have the active potential that is going to come from the motor neuron that is then going to synapse onto our muscle fiber. Okay, when we look at our muscle fiber closer up, we can see that we have synaptic vesicles that are filled with our neurotransmitter acetylcholine. We have calcium. So once the action, action potential reaches the axon terminal, calcium is going to rush in, and those are voltage-gated channels because the voltage is going to change as we have the action potential that runs down. That's then going to cause the acetylcholine to be released from the synaptic vesicles into our synaptic cleft. Okay, so voltage-gated calcium channels open, calcium enters the axon terminal, moving down its concentration gradients. Okay, calcium entry causes the acetylcholine to be released by exocytosis. And then acetylcholine will diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to the receptors on the sarcolemma. Okay, that is then going to cause for the sodium to start to enter. Okay, so when we have the acetylcholine binding channels chemically gated, they will then open and they will allow for sodium to rush in. And potassium is also going to be able to leave um, but in general, more sodium is what we're going to be kind of worried about. So more sodium ions enter than potassium exit. Okay, so this is going to produce a local change in the membrane potential and can actually cause an action potential if there is enough stimulus. Okay, acetylcholine will be terminated by an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. And once the acetylcholine is no longer there, it will not be able to bind the acetylcholine binding ion channels, and the ion channels will close, which will then prevent from sodium coming in and potassium from leaving those specific channels. And here's a video if you want to watch. Hopefully, it'll work for you. If not, um, go on, go Google kind of neuromuscular junction on YouTube, and you should be able to find lots of videos that are going to be really good about how to um, this process goes. So, just a little bit about the neuromuscular junction. The neuromuscular junction can be the site of um, some damage if we have toxins, certain drugs, and diseases that will actually interfere with how the process that I just described happens. Now. Botulism um, is a bacterial um, toxin that can actually cause the neuromuscular junction to stop functioning. So it kind of blocks um, the action of the acetylcholine from being able to open those ion channels. Um, there's also this disease called um, Mal Malaysia gravis. And I know I said that first part wrong. Um, but it is characterized by drooping, upper eyelids, difficulty swallowing and talking, and generalized muscle weakness. Okay, and what happens is that it involves a storage of acetylcholine receptors uh, because the person's acetylcholine receptors are attacked by their own antibodies. And so this is some type of an autoimmune disease, which is then going to prevent the muscles from kind of contracting in the way that they would normally. All right, so we've now talked about kind of how the message goes from the axon terminal to now the motor end plate of the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma is going to be polarized when it's resting, okay? And what polarization again means, I described this in that other video, is that there is going to be a difference in the voltage from outside to inside. And so, Generally, we're always going to have positive charges on the outside of the cell, kind of at resting, and we're going to have negative charges inside the cell. Okay, so there is going to be a cell, a difference between the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid. Okay, so inside of the cell is negative compared to the outside. Now, what happens when action potential comes, it will cause changes in the electrical 
um, charges. Okay, so the action potential will come in and is going to occur in three steps. There is going to be generation of an end plate potential, and so this is going to be kind of when an action potential is going to start to form right here where we start to have an increase in the positive charge because we have all these sodium ions running into the cell. We then are going to have depolarization. And so depolarization is when we go from kind of having a negative inside to a positive inside. So being polarized, again, remember, it means that there is kind of a difference between one side and the other. When we have depolarization, it makes it so that the inside is more similar to the outside and becomes more positive. And then the last step is called repolarization. So it's always important to be able to rem to go back to resting because you need to have the, the sarcolemma back at resting so it could actually take in a new um, nerve impulse. So the first step is this end plate potential. So acetylcholine is released from the motor neurons and is going to bind to the acetylcholine receptors on the sarcolemma. That is then going to cause these ion channels that are chemically, chemically, gate, chemically gated to open, okay? That then allows for sodium to diffuse into the muscle fiber. Sodium moves inside because there is electrochemical gradient. There is more sodium outside than there is inside, and so it's going to move down its concentration gradient, but there also is going to be this electrical gradient where the outside is positive, the inside is negative, and the positive sodium is going to be attracted to the negative charge of the inside of the cell. There is going to be some potassium that is going to diffuse outward, but is not at a very high level. Because the sodium diffuses in, the interior of the sarcolemma is going to become less negative or more positive, and this is going to then cause this depolarization. Okay, so we're going to have a local depolarization of this end plate, which is then going to start to travel down to the T-tubules. Okay, so here's an image of that. We have the acetylcholine containing synaptic vesicles. They are then going to fuse with the axon terminal, release their product, go into the synaptic cleft attached to these ion channels. Sodium is going to rush in and then it's going to cause this wave of depolarization. So the depolarization is going to be generation and propagation of the action potential in the muscle cell, okay? And so it's gonna be moving across the sarcolemma of the muscle cell. If there is enough of a action potential caused at the end plate, it will then cause kind of this threshold to be passed and we will then have voltage gated sodium channels that are going to be on the sarcolemma to start to open, so more of them. So it kind of causes this cascade of events where the initial depolarization of this one area then causes depolarization of the next area that's right next to it. Okay, and so that will then cause these sodium gated channels to open. These are different sodium gated channels. They are voltage gated, which means that they are reacting to the change in voltage, not that there's acetylcholine present. Okay, so this is completely different from those acetylcholine um, ion channels. This will then cause a large influx of sodium. So it's going to have sodium is going to be rushing into the cell again because it's going down a concentration gradient and it's going towards um, kind of a negative charge. That will then trigger this action potential and once an actual potential is started it is unstoppable and will lead to a muscle fiber contraction. Okay so once you pass a certain threshold and the action potential starts the action potential has to go. Uh, there's a point of no return for the action potential. Once the action potential spreads across the lemma, um, from one voltage-gated sodium channel to the next one in adjacent areas, okay? And so it's going to cause this kind of cascade of sodium channels opening. So if we have kind of depolarization happening and we have these sodium channels that are on here, we're going to have kind of the first one open, which then causes this voltage-gated one to open, then that opens, and then so on and so forth until it travels down the sarcolemma.
So here we have kind of our first picture. And now we're looking at this next um, image right here. And so we have the kind of sodium channels that are going to be voltage gated. Okay. And so um, this pink sodium channel is going to react to the voltage. And so what you're going to see is that we now have a negative net charge on the outside of the cell and a positive net charge on the inside of the cell. So this is now the action potential that is going to be propagated down the rest of the sarcolemma. We are going to also start to look at our potassium channels. At this point, the potassium channel is going to be closed. It is not going to open until a little bit later. Then we have the next step, which is going to be repolarization. So we're still kind of right now just talking about action potential across the sarcolemma. We're not actually talking about how the muscle is going to start contracting yet. We're going to get there. But after a membrane has been depolarized or made less negative, it then has to go back to its resting conditions, which is going to be kind of our resting membrane potential. So when the sodium ga voltage gated channels close, and they'll close because after kind of this wave of action potential, there is no second wave of action potential unless another neuron is going to be firing in there. Um, but there is going to be this period of time where no new nerve impulse can actually cause an action potential. And so the voltage gated channels will start to close. Okay, and when that happens, the voltage gated potassium channels start to open. Now, potassium is a positive ion. And at this point, we have kind of more of a positive charge inside the cell than outside the cell because we've been depolarized. So potassium is going to rush out of the cell, both because of the chemical gradient and this electrochemical gradient. And so that will then bring the membrane back to its resting membrane voltage. And this is what I was talking about in the, just a little bit ago. This refractory period is there's a time period where muscle fiber cannot be stimulated again. It has to be able to come back to the resting membrane potential before it is able to be depolarized again. Okay, and so there is this, it's not a very long period of time, but it does have to go back to repolarized um, situation before we can have a new action potential that will come in. So the um, un ionic conditions of the resting state are then going to be restored by these sodium potassium pumps. And so they're going to start pumping the sodium back out of the cell and going to be pumping so potassium back into the cell like we started. And again, if you're wondering about kind of the sodium potassium relationship, make sure that you've watched the previous lecture where I talk about action potentials and how important the sodium potassium are. Okay, because it's going to be important to know that in a normal cell, we are going to have high concentration of sodium inside the cell and high concentration of sodium outside the cell. And then um, kind of they're going to tend to want to move down their concentration gradients, but then we have to build that concentration gradient back up. Okay, so sodium is pumped back out. Potassium that flowed outside will be pumped back in. So after the depolarizing event, um, and as it's moving down the sarcolemma, we are then going to start having kind of this wave, second wave of repolarization. And so in order to restore the sarcolemma to its original resting membrane potential, the sodium channels will now be closed. So sodium is no longer going to be able to enter the cell and the potassium channels will actually open, which is going to lead, allow for potassium to start to leave the cell. So this is what an action potential looks like when we're looking at specifically kind of depolarization and repolarization. And so our resting membrane potential is around negative 90 um, millivolts. And so that's down here. Um, this is kind of where the standard uh, membrane potential is going to be. And then when we have our sodium channels open, that's then going to cause this increase of depolarization, okay, which means it's becoming more positive. And then at this top point, we then have sodium channels start to close and potassium channels open, which the potassium is now leaving the cell. So if you have a positive leaving the cell, it's going to make the whole um, inside the membrane more negative, which is then going to reduce the voltage. And then we're going to get back to kind of our standard 
um, rusty membrane potential. So we're now going to move on to the contraction part of this. So this is the part where we have kind of excited sarcolemma. So we have this active potential that is running through the muscle fiber, but how is it then going to cause the contraction? So we have these two events coupled, okay, and we're going to expl explain how all of that is going to take place. So this is going to be kind of the event that transmits the action potential along the sarcolemma to the T tubules that will ultimately cause for this um, sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. Okay, so this, uh, I just said this active potential is propagated along the sarcolemma and down into the T tubules. The T tubules are right next to um, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. There are going to be voltage sensitive proteins in the tubules that are going to stimulate calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When the the calcium is released, it's going to then cause contraction. Okay, so if you remember back to when I was talking about the tropomyosin and troponin, so troponin is going to bind calcium and then that's going to cause the tropomyosin to move off of the myosin binding sites on the actin. Okay, the action potential is very brief and it will end before the contraction is seen. So it kind of set, starts this whole process and it will have ended before we actually have the contraction. When I talk about this, you know, this is all happening very, very quickly inside of our bodies, um, but we're just kind of slowing it down. So, so here we have kind of an overview of the excitation contraction coupling. Okay, so we have the, the neuron um, coming in, the axon terminal that's going to then um, interact with the motor end plate on the sarcolemma. When we have the action potential that is going to be generated it is then going to move down the sarcolemma and it's going to start interacting with the T-tubules. So the action potential will actually travel down the T-tubule and is going to then cause these voltage gated channels to open, which will release calcium from the sarcolemma or from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sorry. When the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases the calcium, the calcium is then going to be able to interact with the troponin. It will bind the troponin and that will cause a conformational change in how the tropomyosin is attached to the actin. It causes the actin myosin binding sites to be exposed and the myosin heads will then be able to interact with the actual actin. Okay. And we're going to talk a little bit more about in detail of how, what happens once the myosin head is actually attached to the actin to cause the contraction. Okay. And so this is just another image that's going to show kind of the calcium released and this whole process. But the main thing is that we saw um, we have kind of our action potential that's going to be moved down into the T tubules. It's going to cause these voltage gated ion channels to open and allow for calcium to be released. Okay. And calcium is going to be then allowed to attach to tropo troponin. Here's going to be a video that will show this process, the excitation contraction coupling. All right. So now we're at the cross bridge cycling stage and we're going to first talk about what happens when there is no calcium kind of in the system or very low calcium. And so when there's low calcium, you're going to have troponin that is going to be bound to both actin and the tropomyosin, and the tropomyosin is going to be blocking the myosin binding sites. Okay, so tri tropomyosin blocks active sites on actin. Myosin heads cannot attach. The myosin heads are already ready to go because they're kind of just there ready, but they cannot bind the actin until the tropomyosin is off of the kind of that active site. This is when the muscle is relaxed. Okay, so if there's no 
action potential coming in, the muscle is in a relaxed state. We have myosin that's going to be on its own and the actin is on its own. They are not going to interact yet. When we start to have the action potential that moves down the sarcolemma, goes into the T-tubules, which then cause a change in the shape of these voltage sensitive proteins that will then cause the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium to the cytosol. And then we are now going to have a different um, thing happen with actin myosin because they will now be able to interact with each other. So when there's high intracellular calcium, the calcium will bind to troponin. Troponin will change shape and will move the tropomyosin off of the myosin binding sites. Okay, so as you can see in this image right here, we now have tropomyosin binding sites that are available and ready. Okay, and you also have your myosin ready. Myosin heads are now al allowed to bind with the actin and they cause the cross bridge. Okay, so the cross bridge again is going to be when you have a connection between the actin and the myosin and it's because of this um, binding to each other. Now, cycling is initiated and the cycle is going to, we'll explain what the cycle is, um, but this is going to cause for the sarcomere to shorten and the muscle con to contract. So what's going to happen is we're going to have myosin that's going to be bound to the actin. It's going to then kind of cause for the muscle contraction. The myosin head will then release, will bind again, cause muscle contraction. And so we're going to go through this kind of these steps. When the nervous system stimulation uh, ceases, so when the axe potential stops, calcium will be pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the contraction will end. Okay, so just like anything, we do not want our muscles in a constant state of contraction. We need them to relax, and so calcium will be pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum when we are done with kind of the nerve impulse and contraction. But as long as calcium is present, your muscles will have kind of form these cross bridges. So there are four steps of this cross bridge cycle, and this is happening um, in when you're having muscle contraction. And what I want you to realize is that this is happening with millions and millions of different actin and myosin um, myofilaments within a muscle. Okay, and so we have so many of these, and you're, they're all going to be kind of working um, together. So the first step is that we're going to have a cross bridge formation. So that's going to be right here. So this is the mean one. So the cross bridge formation, and we're going to have kind of a high energy myosin head is going to attach to the actin filament active site. Okay, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this high energy myosin head. But if you can see, there is going to be an ADP that is connected to the actual myosin head. The next step is that we're going to do the working power stroke. Okay, and so that's going to be this step right here. So two. So myosin head is going to pivot and is going to pull the thin filament toward the M line. Okay, so you're going to kind of take the my the the actin and you're going to pull it based on how the head changes from here to here. Okay, and then you can actually see how it's going to move. The third step, the cross bridge is going to detach. And the reason why the myosin head will detach is because ATP is going to bind to the myosin head at the ATP binding site. And this causes the myosin head to break off of the actin. The last step right here, four, is going to be the caulking of the myosin head. And so the, the ATP is going to be hydrolyzed into ADP and um, phosphate, and that is going to change the conformation of the head, which then is going to get it ready to be attaching to actin once again. So it's going to happen over and over again. As long as we have calcium present and ATP is present, this is going to happen. Okay, so this energy will be used for power stroke in the next cross bridge. So here's the first step. 
So the cross bridge formation, we have a myosin head that has an ADP and a phosphate ion. And this is going to be attached to the myosin head and the myosin head is going to bind to the actin site. Okay, so this is an energized head. So it's ADP plus that phosphate. This is considered energized. We then are going to have release of those energized molecules. So the ADP and the phosphate will release. When they release, they give off energy, which is causing the head to then change shape. Okay, so it's changing to its bent low energy state um, so that it is now kind of given off energy and has pulled the actin towards the M line. Then the myosin head will have ATP bind to it. When ATP binds to the myosin head, it will detach from the actin, okay, which causes the cross bridge to break. We then have the caulking of the myosin head to get this ready to start over. What happens is the ATP is going to be hydro, um, goes through hydrolysis, hydrolysis, which is going to be when you kind of break off one of the phosphates from the ADP, from the ATP, forming ADP and the PI. Okay, and so this is now in the caulked position. So you have the head that was kind of bent now moves back up and is in this caulked position. It is now ready to bind the, the actin again and cause this whole thing to happen over and over again. So here's the whole process. Now, the one thing I just wanted to point out is that this process will continue to happen as long as there's calcium present, okay? Because calcium has to be present in order to keep tropomyosin off of um, the binding sites. And you also have to have ATP. So if you do not have ATP, then you are not gonna be able to have your myosin heads detach. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because what happens when you die is you can go into something called rigor mortis, where your muscles actually are in a contracted state. And so what happens is calcium starts to trickle out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and causes the myosin heads to bind to the actin, but there is no ATP because if you're dead, you're not going to be doing cellular respiration. And so you'll have the, kind of the heads attached to the um, kind of in this cross bridge form, basically until your proteins start to degrade and everything starts to fall apart. But that is why you can have murder mortis um, when you have a dead body. Okay, so here is going to be a video about cross bridge cycling. So here's just a little more about this rigor mortis. So this happens about three to four hours after death when the muscles begin to stiffen. Um, so the peak is gonna ha hit about 12 hours post-mortem. And what happens is intracellular cal calcium levels increase because um, we no longer have ATP to pump the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And we have cross bridge that form ATP is needed for the cross bridge to detach, and because we have no ATP, they will continue to stay attached. This results in the myosin head staying bound to actin, causing a constant state of contraction. Okay, and then the muscles will stay contracted until the muscle proteins break down, which will then cause the myosin to release. Okay, so this is just what happens, and this kind of gives you a good idea of what would happen if you have any type of situation where you run out of ATP in your muscles um, when you're kind of doing some athletic event or um, have something happen because you can't need constant ATP. And so at some point, your muscles no longer have ATP. You're not going to be able to continue kind of exercising. Your body's going to stop, basically make you stop um, exercising. All right, so that's going to be the end of this lecture. Um, always like to end it on an interesting note. Thanks.